Well, it was a dysfunctional family. Uh, she wasn't attacked to our mother. She didn't hug or kiss her children. And the same was true of her own parents to her. There we are. Later on, a unique assessment of Margaret Thatcher from a former Kent MP who saw her up close and personal because he dated her daughter. But first, three people from our region who want to become MPs, all recently selected to stand at the next election. With us, Tanmanji Singh Desi, Labour's candidate in Gravesham in Kent, Vicky Slade, who's standing for the Lib Dems in Mid Dorset and North Pool, and Conservative Clarence Mitchell, who'll be trying to unseat Britain's first Green MP in Brighton Pavilion. Let's talk first of all about being selected. You were selected a few months ago, uh, Tan. How did that feel? Yes, you, I mean, it's a great honour and a privilege to have been selected uh, by our local members in Gravesham um, so it's quite uh, a lengthy process and uh, nominations and applications are received from across the country so yeah it's uh, definitely a great honour. And it's a seat that's held by the Conservatives at the moment, Labour think they can win it back. Vicky your seat is held by the Lib Dems, is, the yes. present MP is retiring she so um, you're yeah. hoping to take over there? Yes um, I went through a sort of about an eight month process um, to be whittled down and uh, and then quite a quite a competitive process. Because there aren't that many Lib Dem held seats so there must be there quite a lot of competition. Exactly. There are a lot of people after every seat that, that's going. And uh, but you know, I, I've been there for the last 14 years, so uh, it was very much something that I was desperate to to win and got it. And uh, I'm looking forward to the challenge. And, and Brighton Pavilion, of course, Clarence is going to be one of those seats that everybody's going to be looking at at the next election. So it must have been a tough fight to get the Tory nomination for that. It's a tough fight uh, to get selected for any Tory seat. It's quite a, a lengthy process from getting onto the list of candidates who can then apply for seats and then go through the various stages with the individual associations. Um, as Tom was saying, it is a great honour to be the candidate. I'm very much looking forward to it. It's something I've always wanted to do personally. I still believe there is dignity and purpose in, in seeking public office. Um, and if I can play a small part in changing people's perception of politicians in the campaign to come, then I'm, I'll be proud to do that. But you're right, Brighton is going to come in for a lot of attention. It's, we're going to make it a very visible campaign. Uh, it's a unique seat in many respects, and um, I'm very much looking forward to it. OK, well, as we've heard, our three candidates here were all selected by members of their local party in the traditional way. But the Conservatives are doing things a little bit differently in two of their safest seats, Wealdon in Sussex and Tunbridge and Morling in Kent. Kevin Harrison reports. It's a safe bet to say most of us don't think of elections and open primaries most of the time. And even if you do, then it's perhaps scenes like this in the USA that come to mind. A wet weekend in Westmoreland is a long way from the excitement of an American presidential election. But there is one similarity. Tunbridge and Morling Conservatives are using a primary too. That is, the election of their candidate won't be decided by the local Conservative Association, but by all the voters who care to take part in the area. Labour, Lib Dem, Tory, it doesn't matter how you normally vote. You have a say in the Tory candidate selection. It's a conservative area, this, in more ways than one. So what do locals make of the new way of doing things? In principle, it's probably a good idea, but um, how well informed will people be about the candidates? Do you think the Conservative Party is brave to try something like this? It's brave, but it's a good idea. It's an experiment that's in its infancy. And there are rumours that the Prime Minister, although originally keen on the project, is now much less so. So what do local Conservatives think about the perceived scepticism of what's going on? Well, we, to be quite frank, don't care what 10 Downing Street wants. We care what Tunbridge and Morling residents want. We're all reali realistic. People are not joiners of political parties uh, or of many organisations in the way they used to be. If you go back 50 years, this association had 10,000 members. Uh, almost everybody who is politically committed. Uh, uh, it's not the case in this day and age, so we have to move with the times. So will other parties move with the times too? Labour or Lib Dem activists are thin on the ground on these streets, but one we met had little doubt. The Tories were paving the way. Shouldn't the Labour Party be trying something like this? I think I'll be writing to um, Ed Middleband and recommending what they're doing in Morling and Tunbridge uh, to him, yeah. And he's a Labour activist, Tam. What, what should Ed Miliband say back to him, do you think? 
Well, I think uh, overall uh, there are many uh, respects uh, within which uh, you know the Labour Party is leading the way. Uh, I mean, we're when we uh, refer to open primaries, uh, we've already stated that in the next uh, London mayoral election we'll be having an open primary for that as well to choose our candidate. Uh, but uh, if we look at overall representation, I'm very proud of the Labour Party in terms of uh, its representation with regards to uh, women, with regards to ethnic minorities, people with disabilities. Uh, you know, we're proud to have more uh, female and uh, ethnic minority candidates than all of the other parties put together. This primary idea is not new, of course, Clara Mitchell. At the last election, a couple of Tories were chosen, including Caroline Dynage in our region, uh, from Gosport. The trouble with it is it's a rather expensive way of doing things, isn't it? Presumably they're quite a rich association, they can pay for it themselves. Well, it, yes, there is undoubtedly more cost associated with it, but, but nevertheless, it is about as democratic as you can get. Yeah. And um, the Conservatives are not afraid to have people within the constituency of any political persuasion have a say in their candidate. That person is going to be standing for their vote anyway, um, so why not have them involved in that early stage? We found that it's been an experiment that's worked and, and more and more associations are considering it as an option. It's not, not, going, it's not working everywhere yet, yeah. but um, you know, it's, it's been a success so Good far. Good idea, Vicky Slade? Um, it sounds like a great idea. I mean, you, you, you said exactly how expensive it is. And I think it's very easy when you've got two parties that have got a, a lot of money coming in from different sources. But when you're like the Liberal Democrats don't have you know, big finances. Um, and the smaller parties, how on earth would they cope? Yeah. You know, if you haven't got a lot of money behind you, this adds even more cost to what is already very, very expensive. OK, <laughs> let's talk about some of the things you'll be fighting the next election over. And it would appear since that speech in, uh, in Brighton, funnily enough, Clarence Mitchell, <coughs> energy prices. And Ed Miliband seems to have uh, taken the initiative on, on this and not lost it. Well, if, if you believe a, a price freeze gimmick is taking the initiative, then perhaps he has. But um, we, we don't believe the price freeze, as described, would work. Um, what's to stop the companies putting the prices up beforehand and afterwards? We've already seen that beginning to happen. So it's a con, Tan? Uh, not quite. I think uh, Ed has shown... Uh a visionary leadership in the sense that he's actually setting the agenda. Others are following in his footsteps. Yeah, um, he made good headlines, but isn't Clarence right uh, that they'll put up the prices before the freeze, they'll put up the prices after the freeze? Are they meaningless? Hugh, if we look at it now, what's actually happening? You know, just this week gone, and they've already, you know, increased it by 10%, 9%, and so forth. And um, this is way before, you know, 2015 in the next election. So we've got a market which doesn't work. And that is why we had bold steps announced that we need to reform this market and to make it uh, better for hard-working families, those individuals. I mean, it was very interesting with uh, former Prime Minister Sir John Major's intervention, where he said that we need to have some sort of windfall tax. We need to get a hold of the situation. It was also very interesting, um, David Cameron's intervention yesterday, Vicky, when he talked about rowing back on these green Absolutely. Uh, costs, which were inflicted, uh, if that's the word, by Ed Miliband <laughs> largely when he was Secretary of State. You don't, well, you shake your head, it's true, isn't it? But, the, the, you know, the green element it really is, isn't the major problem here. Uh, you know, it's a very small overall cost, and I recognise that people are hard-pressed in their energy bills, but, but, you know, it's all very well saying, yes, we're going to save a little bit of money now, but actually we're looking to try and build a long-term, sustainable, fair price for energy, and that's not going to happen if, you know, we, we make policy on the hoof by just trying to Vote say... Oh, blue, go green, Clarence yeah. Mitchell well, used to say. So no, well, our, our policies are, are greener than the Greens in some respects, but the point with this is the market needs to be fundamentally changed. There need to be far more companies coming in, greater competition will eventually bring down prices, there needs to be better regulation, there need to be better deals. We're already, the, the Conservative-led government is already legislating to put people on the lowest tariffs. That's the sort of long-term initiative that will deliver low prices for 20 years, not just 20 months, as a, as a short-term electoral gimmick. I remember 20, 30 years ago, you used to get the bill through the door from the local electricity board and you paid the bill and there wasn't this huge great row about prices and it's privatisation that's caused all this, isn't it? We're all told it's increased competition and better value for money. Is it really? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. I mean, you know, go back to the days of nationalised energy. I mean, the, the, the trouble we had back in the 70s. Um, this is essentially a, a free market that needs that competition on a much more level, greater playing field to allow that to function. And, and basically, the Lib Dems are saying we've got nothing to offer in terms of lowering prices. No, I don't think that's true at all. Um, I think, you know, we've got the, the Warm Homes Initiative. Um, we've got, um, you know, 
legislation coming to make sure that people are on the lowest possible yeah. tariff. Telling people to insulate their homes isn't very sexy, but in fact, but it's, 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 it's the working. most efficient way it, of dealing with the problem. It's the most efficient. There's 230,000 homes will be insulated this year through through the policy. So I think you know those people that have got the most to gain to put, bring them out of fuel poverty. You know we can help, and, and gimmicks and changing policy, you know, ju just for, for vote winning is not the answer. We've got to have a long term way of making things better. And he obviously you referred earlier to uh, the. Um, green taxes. Now, I'd like to actually, it's a matter of fact that 60% of those green taxes have actually been instituted by the current government. So it wasn't the previous government that have put, uh, put that into place. And also with regards to green taxes, I mean, it, uh, wasn't it the current Prime Minister who, before going into office, said that we, this would be the greenest government ever? And in terms of uh, green taxes, they should actually constitute a greater proportion of overall taxes. I mean, uh, George Osborne was the one that actually said that uh, uh, green taxes make sense for the economy while also making sense for the okay. environment. We'll hold it there and we'll be back after this very short break. Many books have been written about Margaret Thatcher, but the latest, written by a former MP from our region, offers a unique perspective. To Jonathan Aitken, back in the late 70s, she wasn't just the Tory leader, she was his girlfriend's mum. He dated Carol Thatcher for three years before dumping her so unceremoniously Mrs Thatcher didn't forgive him for a decade. But courting Carol meant he saw the Mrs Thatcher the rest of us never saw. She was sort of superwoman uh, on a kind of super activity. She bustled around the kitchen like a sort of chef on fast forward, uh, bossing everybody around. Her favourite dish, I recall, was coronation chicken and she was always commanding everybody to get out of the way, she had to run the show in the kitchen as well as the world. On the whole, it was a dysfunctional family. Uh, she wasn't attacked to our mother. She didn't hug or kiss her children. And the same was true of her own parents to her. And politics came a long way first. And I don't think you could call it a happy and well-adjusted family. Would she have made a good mother-in-law? I never thought of her like that. The MP for Eastbourne, Ian Gow, was her most trusted aide. He was murdered in 1990 by an IRA car bomb at his home in the village of Hankham. Ian Gow is one of the heroes of my book. He was her wittiest, her wisest, and really closest advisor for quite some time. He was really in, in love with her in a political sense, and uh, venerated her, adored her, which in turn made her like him a lot. If Ian Gower had survived, I don't believe that Margaret Thatcher would have been uh, thrown out the way she so wrongly and cruelly was by the Parliamentary Party. As Prime Minister, she had to deal with plenty of rebellious MPs, including Jonathan Aitken. She was quite harsh with rebels. She would say things like, why are you talking such extraordinary nonsense? On the other hand, the area where I was mainly a rebel was to do with Europe. And she herself was shifting away from being a Europhile to a Eurosceptic. Uh, one night there was an order in the House of Commons to harmonise lawnmower noise. This sounds as though it's a comic term, but it's true. And when she heard that this requirement was going through the House of Commons and there was a big rebellion, she said, I'll see about that. So in the end, she was a rebel too. But she joined us to the continent of Europe by signing the Channel Tunnel Treaty. Again, Aitken rebelled. She was sweet-talked into the Channel Tunnel by President Mitterrand. He wanted a cars-only Channel Tunnel. She wanted a bridge. And they sort of had this botched-up compromise. One of her qualities was, when she'd made a decision, she stuck to it. And in those early years when I was a leading rebel on the Channel Tunnel, I was sticking up for the ferry ports in my constituency, she heard those criticisms and listened to me uh, somewhat restlessly, restively, um, but she co couldn't admit that there was anything wrong with it. So we agreed to differ. And after her, her fall, she, she came down to Thanet in one of the general elections to campaign for you? She gave one of her last and most magnificent speeches uh, to a very rowdy crowd and um, 
She all but said Britain should withdraw from the European Union, but just the last minute with her aides flapping, she pulled herself back and qualified it. She, she came to Thanet a lot. She also, of course, lived in Kent a lot because Dennis was from Kent. She, her career started in Dartford in Kent. She was turned down, amazingly, by a lot of Kent seats uh, for really because of the bias and prejudice against women candidates in the uh, 50s. Uh, so she had a bumpy ride in, in Kent, but I think she was very fond of it as a county. And Vicky, whatever you think of her politics, she did help, I suppose, blaze the trail. And it is easier for women these days, still difficult, but easier for women to get selected uh, it's, as candidates. It's interesting you should say that. I mean, I think she she was a great inspiration. I mean, you know, to me as a, as a girl growing up, you know, it was, well, if she could do it, there's no reason why I can't do it. But even last night, I was challenged on, well, hang on a minute, you've got four children. Sh should you really be talking about going to Westminster? So I don't think the world has changed all that much. Yeah, and she obviously found um, it difficult to have that sort of work-life balance. Clearly, you know, that, yeah. that was something that, that perhaps didn't come naturally, I don't know, but yeah. uh, I didn't know her, so it would be hard to say. But it yeah. is a huge balance, uh, and the world hasn't moved on a great deal, I don't yeah. think. Oh, you remember her because you were a reporter in Finchley, weren't you? I was privileged. My very first reporting job in local newspapers was the Hendon and Finchley Times, and she was a great friend of my editor, Dennis Signey, at the time. So it would lead to the faintly surreal experience of trying to write up the latest Golden Wedding report or a baby show results, and in would come the Prime Minister. Really? Yes, with special branch, and she'd come and sit down with Dennis and have a conversation for a couple of hours and eventually we'd get the national papers, this is long before mobile phones, ringing us up saying we know she's in the constituency, where is she? And we'd have to say I have no idea, I could see her sitting there in the office. Uh, she was a fantastic constituency MP, whatever you think of her national politics, she, she worked incredibly hard, she always arrived early and she, she remembered um, a constituent she hadn't seen for years down to which course their, their daughter or son was studying at which university um, she really was uh, a, a living embodiment, if you like, of Finchley at the time, and it was it was a fantastic and formative experience to work uh, so closely together yeah. with her at that stage. Okay, let's talk business again, Tan. How are you going to win Gravesham? What, what's going to win it for you? Do you think? Well, I think um, obviously the cost of living crisis, I think, is the key issue on the doorstep uh, in terms of uh, you know even with regards not just energy prices but also rail fares. Uh, it's now costs in excess of three thousand pounds just for an annual pass for uh, commuters to but go what from Gravesham. I mean, that's where I think uh, once again, you know, we have to look at that market to see how we can help to reform it. You know, the, the, the um, caps uh, on prices, uh, unfortunately, what's constantly happening is that the operators, uh, you know, via loophole, are consistently increasing prices, and that is hitting commuters hard. But Labour have changed their tack, haven't they? It's no longer the economy's going down the plug hole, double-dip recession, we're all doomed. It's now cost of living crisis, because you recognise that they're actually turning the, the economy around. Is that right? Well, I mean, you know, th that obviously uh, is a matter for debate in terms of, uh, you know, just how much the economy is turning around. Because uh, although uh, in an overall sense, uh, you know, we've got figures that demonstrate that, you know, there's growth. If we look at the impact on ordinary, you know, members of the British public, yeah. I think they are feeling, feeling a pinch. We're not feeling yeah. better off, are not we, really? Better off. What about the Liberal Democrats? Because there is a theory that um, you'll be sort of reduced to a handful of MPs at the next election. But people who look at it more closely, say no. where you're dug in, you will do quite well, as you did in Eastleigh, of course. Absolutely. And the reality is that we've proved now that, you know, we it, government is better with us in it. You know, I think the evidence is that the Conservatives can't be fair uh, and the Labour Party have proved that, you know, they find it difficult to build a, a stronger economy. We can do both. And I think, you know, there's something to be, to be gained from having the Lib Dems in government. We're not a party of protest anymore. We've been a party of government. And a lot more people will now take us seriously who previously thought it was a wasted vote. Or a lot of people will feel betrayed over things like tuition fees and not vote for you again. I think the reality on tuition fees, if you talk to young people who are actually going through that process, they'll actually accept and realise that they're actually getting a pretty good deal on tuition fees. A lot of what went wrong for us with tuition fees was it, it was very early on in the government. It was very early on in our PR machine. You know, we're a much Should have been a red party. line in the coalition agreement, shouldn't Possibly it? Possibly should have been, but actually maybe Nick should have made sure that, uh, you know, David Cameron was stood shoulder to shoulder with him on that and not allowed Nick to be the scapegoat for that. 
that, uh, but that was naivety, I think. OK, Clara Swisher, lots of Tory MPs at the moment are frustrated by the fact that they are, they, in their view, held back by the Liberal Democrats. Obviously, you want a, a proper Conservative majority in this session, but the maths make that very difficult, don't they? It would be an incredible achievement if David Cameron could pull that off. Well, um, the, the boundary changes that should have come in um, would have certainly helped and would have made it a much fairer and uh, level playing field in many respects. Because so, the so system is biased against the Conservatives. Well, well, indeed it is, and that, that's not just sour grapes. It's a fact. It's an ar arithmetical fact. Um, however, we are where we are. Um, we are as compassionate and caring as any of the other parties. You know, Compassion is not a, a monopoly uh, of the parties on the on the left. Um, and so we will understand and uh, work towards alleviating the cost of living crisis as it has been portrayed. In Brighton particularly, it has suffered from uh, what I describe as a, a green experiment for the last few years, uh, which has failed dismally both locally and in terms of the national politics. Caroline Lucas, um, uh, committed as she is, uh, is a lone voice in Parliament. Um, the people of Brighton need a party that can de deliver on the economy nationally, as we are seeing, and that is now happening, and the benefits of that recovery need to flow into Brighton, and I'll be playing my part in making sure that that prosperity returns quickly. OK, finally, the government say they want to encourage small businesses. I'm not sure they're too happy with the success of Katrina Stiff, who's, funnily enough, from Brighton. She's been knitting pin cushions modelled on members of the Cabinet. She says business is booming, and the best seller is Michael Gove. So uh, who's buying them? It's mainly teachers or people sympathetic with teachers, which I am as well. Um, yeah, so far for the Michael Gove one, definitely struck a chord with them. What is it do you think about people wanting to stick pins in, in members of parliament? I think it's frustration. I think a lot of people just, just that little release of sticking pins in a politician uh, is just something everyone wants to do, apparently. <laughs> And yet there's no shortage of people who want to be MPs. You still want to be MPs, yeah? yeah? Absolutely. Oh, I'm uh, willing to have a pin stuck in here. <laughs> that's that's what yeah. it takes. It's, it's, it's a small price to pay. <laughs> that's right. OK, well, thank you all very much indeed for joining us. It's been great fun uh, to meet you all. Thank you for your company too. We'll be back again with another edition of The Last Word next month. And don't forget, you can catch uh, up with all the latest political developments every night on our news programme at 6 o'clock here on ITV Meridian. Thanks for watching and sleep well. Mm -hmm.